one. All right. And hello, everybody. So today, um, we're going to be talking about a few cool things. Uh, so uh, it's been a few weeks since we last chatted. Um, uh, life uh, gets busy around the holidays. So uh, we're going to try to, you know, keep consistent with this. Um, but the frequency may uh, reduce slightly. Uh, Shashank and I were just uh, chatting. Um, I think we were pretty consistently about uh, publishing episodes like once per week. Uh, it might be closer to like once every two weeks. So uh, our new cadence, what we're going to try to do is we're going to really try to grow this thing. Uh, so uh, we're going to spend probably one week doing the podcast. And then the next week, the time that we do the podcast time, we're going to not be posting an episode, but we're going to try to uh, like work on and grow uh, the podcast because our goal is to get as many listeners as possible uh, for this podcast. So if you are listening, thank you for listening. Uh, uh, and if you're new to the podcast, thank you for checking it out. We are a, uh, I guess now like a bi-weekly podcast, <laughs> which uh, will uh, talk about uh, different things. Like uh, we run a meetup uh, in the uh, South Bay of uh, Silicon Valley. We um, meet a lot of really cool people who are uh, building awesome AI tools and uh we kind of have some access. So uh, we wanted to share uh, like our learnings with you. So uh, together we talk about the news. We talk about uh, like our opinions, just about whatever uh, when it comes to uh, generative AI and kind of just like AI and life in general. So if that is something you're interested in, uh, feel free to continue to listen. And if you like it, uh, leave us a five star. Uh, we think it helps. We've heard that. We've heard that's a good thing. So yes, uh, we're trying to just like grow the total number of listeners. So if you have uh, questions or uh, concerns, complaints, reach out. Uh, we'll put like some sort of way to contact us in the description. Um, so we'll put like a email or something. So uh, yeah, you can uh, reach out to us and uh, give us just your feedback. Uh, if you want uh, any thing that we should talk about, if you know of any guests, uh, if you like this format, if you like a different format, just let us know. And uh, we're like actively trying to I improve the podcast. So uh, with that, uh, let's get started with the news. Shashank, uh, have you heard about the Suno V4? I have, um, but I haven't had a chance to check it out yet. Um, I was really impressed by the previous versions of Suno. So this is exciting to see what more they have. It seems like uh, this is going to be an iterative improvement over the previous versions. Nothing uh, fundamentally newer, but everything seems to be a little bit better. Yeah, so for those who don't know, uh, Suno uh, is AI-generated music. Uh, so it's a company, there's uh, like two companies that I know of that do like AI-generated music. There's Suno, and then there's that other one, which I just forgot. Udio. Udio, that's right. Uh, and um, they're both pretty cool. So Suno... Uh, tends to generate like entire songs. It'll be like two or three minutes uh, each. And then Udio will um, be uh, generate around like 30 second clips. So uh, whereas Suno, you just like generate the whole thing. Uh, Udio kind of like uh, you can sort of work with the AI and make uh, music. So with it, you might say like, I'm going to generate this clip and then like now let me generate like a clip before it or a clip after it. And then you can sort of like generate 30 second clips at a time to make like a whole song um both are pretty cool and uh have really uh good music that's come out but yeah I, I listened to the suno v4 and uh it's very impressive so uh i'm not like the best at describing music but uh it had like vocals and uh like so it did like female vocals and it sounded like somebody was singing so they had like high i don't know what do you call it, like dynamic range or something and uh it, it sounded very impressive uh we could like pull up one and then let's listen to it but yeah i was gonna say should we play a sample for our listeners yeah but let's do that let me let me try to do that okay and, and as, as shashank uh you know does that oh there we go yeah go ahead let's hear it so this is the suno v4 version which is supposed to be better in every way Yeah. So no V. 
Oh, yeah. Feels like I've been waiting for a lifetime. Yeah. Oh, looking forward to today. Mm -hmm. I bet you thought you'll never hear so clearly. Welcome to my serotonin. I can't believe this is AI. This is incredible. The quality is amazing, and I'm not sure how well it translates through uh, playing on my phone, through the mic, to our listeners' uh, ears, but right here, the sound quality feels amazing. Yeah, it, it's it's unreal. Um, just to think that, like, that was AI. I mean, like, even, like, last year, if you would have told me that AI generated that, I would not have believed you. Uh, I would think that you're lying. And I mean, like, uh, <laughs> I, I know that Suno is, like, legit because I've used it. And it's been able to generate things, but um, you could totally believe that that was just like a person singing uh, with like a whole like jazz band or something behind them. Uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. It, it makes me kind of uh, a little bit uh, concerned for uh, the arts because uh, part of me wonders like, let's say you have some sort of um, like genre that you really like. Mm. Um, but maybe that isn't like super popular. Now you could just like generate a bunch of AI music and listen to it. So if if you really like, I don't know, tropical house music or like melodic, uh, uh, deep banjo or something like that, like now you could go and uh, generate a bunch of songs like that. And um, uh, I mean, I feel like people, like artists may just like not get paid um, going forward. Maybe only like the, the, top quality artists or i shouldn't say the top quality but like maybe the, the most famous artists like the ones with the most distribution will be the ones that actually like kind of take home all the money and everybody else like who used to work at maybe like a small bar or an airport lounge or something like that like playing the piano in the corner uh that they would like get tips like uh now like they might just put on the ai generated music from suno mm. and uh those artists are going to be out of business yeah, I mean, that's that's like a tough uh, question because I think a lot of reasons why people listen to music is to feel a connection with the artist, feel a sense of belonging with this bigger community that loves the specific genre of music. Uh, definitely going to concerts and uh, being in person, connecting with that uh, feeling. But I also really appreciate the fact that this can tailor make music for you. I think maybe it might start replacing some of the generic audio creation, maybe like elevator music, uh, something playing in the doctor's waiting room, um, maybe promotional material for like ad campaigns if you're releasing a, you know, a new watch or something, you know, Mark's uh, fancy new uh, AI watch and you can make like a custom soundtrack for that uh, create some buzz and excitement but i i don't know i i can't uh in my mind bring myself to think okay i'm gonna sit down and generate some music for myself and just listen to that all day i kind of want to listen to music that other people also listen to well i don't think that it necessarily has to be like you going to generate the music but what i could see happening is there might be uh somebody who uh just uses this as their main form of like a music creation so where like people would maybe use like their macbook and like some sort of like tools i don't really know what tools you use to generate music or like they would play an instrument so like maybe they would like i have like a whole band they'd have like guitar and their drums and their bass and they would put them all together and they would you know play the music uh now like you might just get somebody who is entire kind of like music journey is just prompting suno or udio to create songs and then they would publish that to my youtube so like it still could like uh be like a song that gets uh published right and everybody's listening to but if you think about it like a lot of like the top djs today like they're just like effectively you know re creating the song first and then they're just hitting play uh mm -hmm. and then they're dancing like uh you know um i, I went to a steve aoki concert mm -hmm. in uh, when I was in Japan and um, he like spent a lot of time dancing. Like he, he definitely was not like actively, you know, 
mixing songs together. Maybe he spent a little time doing that, True. but uh, there's like, you know, whenever the bass dropped, like he was like uh, up, like on top of the speakers, like dancing. Then he like, he was like throwing like cakes into the audience. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, he wasn't like actively playing, but like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, whatever. Um, like that wouldn't have been possible. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, you needed to like, actually like have like a lot of skill to like, play the guitar or like sing or something and now you're just like dancing being like your entertainer so I, I could see that like you know guys like that they just could potentially use something like suno create something get like a song that's popular and then just be like hey everybody let's party Woo! that, that makes sense it brings up the popular mean what do djs actually do because most of it is uh resampling mixing queuing up uh, a playlist that they think will elicit the most excitement and reaction from the crowd so yeah in that sense i i do think this is definitely going to democratize creation of music um songs melodies maybe um i i mean people are using these tools or as accompaniments to the music that they're creating by themselves and adding individual tracks um so i i can see a new genre of artists and creators like DJs coming out and creating music on the fly catered to that specific venue, that specific uh, audience's mood and almost like a live stand-up comic where he's doing like crowd work, listening to individual people seeing, okay, we're, we're here in um, South Bay, we're, we're in Sunnyvale, maybe play off of that, uh, get some, uh, uh, fun uh, riffs about some local politics that's going on, uh, talk about the weather or talk about this, this dude in the corner who's doing something funny and make it more interactive. I think that live element will be really interesting to, I don't know, explore. Oh, that'd be really cool. Uh, you could even like throw in, like as you mentioned, kind of like current events. Like uh, So uh, for those who haven't heard, uh, Donald Trump won the election. Um, you could put that in. Um, you could mention like I don't know, like uh, natural disasters or uh, good things, bad things. Uh, oh, what if you use this as a, a news medium, where or, or like a, a learning medium instead of uh, reading long forms of text and sitting through boring lectures? Turn this into a song, into a fun, catchy melody. Because uh, I've seen there's a couple uh, tools out there that convert long dry textbook material into these uh doom scrolling videos where they have like a minecraft playthrough in the background but the educational material with text overlaid on top because i think social media has figured out the right kind of addiction to hook us onto a video to keep watching but then overlaying something useful on top of that might be like a interesting way to trick your brain into learning something useful yeah yeah that might be kind of neat um i i don't know uh exactly the type of content that that would be best because I, I feel like some content is probably not learned best through song but other things actually is uh so for example i remember when i was in grade school they would ch have us remember like uh the names of like the presidents um and uh they would like have like a song with all the president's names in order. It was like Washington Adams, yeah. Thomas Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and Adam, Jackson was people's choice. So it's like, you know, uh, it keeps on like, going all the way to like the present day. Um, and I actually don't remember like <laughs> much past that, but like I, I still remember that. And nice. that was like, I don't know, I was like in third or fourth grade or something uh, talking about that. So it's like, I, I definitely know that like George Washington was the first president and that was like from the song. So I feel like, um, things like that that can be used like via like mnemonic mm. um, to be really good for a song. Yeah, I think uh, for rote memorization, just repetition really helps. So having something constantly playing in the background, repeating the same, you know, list of presidents in a sing song way, that'd be really helpful. But I, I am kind of excited about new forms of content and uh, media or apps that will come out because of this. So we have the ability to generate a song, custom tailored song, any genre. So this is for our listeners. We just played one genre with like an R&B vibe. It sounded kind of like Rihanna or Beyonce maybe. Uh, but you could create anything from trap to uh, hip hop or classical music, any avant-garde, you know, fringe kind of uh, genre, which blends in 
uh, absolutely disparate, uh, you know, categories. And you can tailor that to specific, very uh, niche categories of, you know, subgenres. Talk about uh, your dog or talk about your uh, day-to-day annoyances, grievances, whatever you want. And if we can do that live, that's like, that is really impressive. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, It it sounds like it it could be um, the future. And I agree that it is nice to have like some sort of like shared experience. So for example, like if you're in the crowd, like everybody is like singing along the same song like that, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't need to be like actually generated by a human for everybody to go and sing along the same song. It could be like computer generated. It might even be better. Yeah. I think it usually takes uh, a little while for the use cases to uh, pop out and emerge. But from a technical standpoint, uh, I find this really cool because this is one of the few popular examples of generative AI outside of LLMs. Because we've had LLMs for a while. Um, they are slightly expanding in their capabilities with uh, images and uh, video and audio understanding. Um, but they, you know, we haven't seen novel use cases outside of text apart from maybe like DeepMind working on AlphaFold and some really um, the frontier of research with uh, chemistry and uh, generating other um, physics simulations. But this is like a cool consumer product that's out there that a lot of people are using today. Uh, Like the average person, like little kids uh, making uh, TikTok videos with this tool that is using really cool novel architectures to understand what is sound, what is music, how to uh, tokenize that, how to break that down into um, a structure that a computer can understand into repeating chunks and synthesize new uh, songs out of it. That's like super cool. A hundred percent. It's like, uh, it's really amazing. Um, And uh, it's just super exciting about just generative AI in in general, right? Like, I mean, um, there's so many things that you could imagine that, like computers may be able to generate, which hopefully will put us into like a a world of abundance. Um, but anyways, um, uh, but sometimes like in order for like the generative AI to be useful, mm. uh, we need to be able to uh, kind of connect it with the real world. So coming to real world uh, use cases, uh, have you seen about this uh, Claude tool use Um or like uh, you can allow, basically you can let Claude like use your computer. I was reading about that. Um, is that publicly available? Can you use it now? I do see a beta. Uh, I, I think it is publicly available. Now, I haven't like used it. Um, so so good. But I have talked to people who have used it. Oh. And uh, so apparently what you can do is uh, you can allow uh, you can like give access Claude to like your your desktop basically. And it can just like go and and do stuff so for example um you could maybe have it like automatically organize your your documents for you um it could maybe like go through each of your your documents and then figure out like what are categories that make sense and Mm -hmm. potentially like put in separate folders it could maybe uh organize your images based off of whatever like maybe like oh this is my travel images these are pictures of uh documents these are um uh, this is this is uh travel images from that time i went to costa rica like four years ago um so i think that like uh you could potentially have uh claude do stuff like that like automatically um without needing to like write a separate program for that which Mm. would be i I think like pretty cool so it kind of like democratize uh the llms Mm. uh which i think like in theory sounds really cool Mm -hmm. and i guess like it works like okay um but the the big downside was uh it's apparently quite expensive mm-hmm. so it's uh been uh kind of uh racking up like i i think uh one of our meetup members used it i think he said he let it go for like a minute or two mm-hmm. and uh it costs like 2 bucks or something for the minute so that seems pricey yeah yeah uh, but it was actually running yeah it was actually running okay um and uh, so that, like that, that's cool. So that seems like a common problem with any kind of agent, though. If you have something running with a big model, you're going to rack up a big bill. Because what, what, what is the token speed uh, right now? I don't know. 
Uh, that's a good question. But regardless, for like, uh, you can make maybe one or two queries every couple seconds. So if you leave it running for a couple minutes, yeah, I can see that. It seems reasonable. Yes, uh, but then like, I, I struggle to think of use cases where uh, it, it would make sense for me to spend that much money mm-hmm. to have it uh, go on my computer. And then also, it's like, it feels kind of risky to have just like an LLM just like running on your computer because you don't know what it's going to do. Like, I mean, how do I know it's not going to go? Forward this email to everyone in my contact list. It could. So forward my bank details, my personal and private pictures, everyone. <laughs> right. Like you, you say it to like uh, organize your photos and then like it sends like an email to like your coworkers, all of your time <laughs> photos. Maybe it, it might go and like, uh, delete things you don't want. Uh, it could corrupt things. Um, like I, I feel like lock you out of your computer. It could. It might just change your password. Oh god! Like uh, I, I think I heard that somebody said that they tried this and then it like uh, started like renaming like their user profile, like the hardware to like Anthropic or something. <laughs> so uh, like maybe if you run in, like a VM and then like you have like a redundant things, it's like okay, like here are the photos, like organize this only. But then it's like, if you go through all that, like you might as well just like make some sort of program or mm. that, that organizes it. Um, I don't know. It, like, I feel like the risk is too high for me to actually want to try it. Um, at least while it's in beta, maybe. Um, I, I, I am excited about this because, uh, so some, I may have mentioned this in the previous podcast. I bought this little device called the rabbit R1. Um, a little handheld uh, accompaniment to your phone that you can ask questions to, uh, point it at things with a camera, and has a little screen that displays information. Um, not that much different from what an app could do on your phone itself. Uh, but what was cool about that company was they wanted to build an LLM agent store, which would essentially do what the Anthropy is doing right now, but on your phone. It would be able to carry out actions in some kind of a virtual machine that has access to your logged in mobile device somehow and carry out actions that you would normally do. So like uh, checking on, I don't know, like the current uh, top trending articles on Hacker News, Reddit, or looking at uh, your DoorDash order, telling you how fast uh, it's going to be here. Um, Anything that you do on your phone, it would kind of like learn from it and be able to repeat those actions um i would love to see that kind of uh a you know uh training or a few shot prompting uh methodology here with anthropic where you carry out an action on your computer uh maybe you're like editing some photos in photoshop and upon some filters doing some uh, custom stuff and this is able to watch what you're doing um, look at all the actions that you take and be like okay i can do this and then you click a button and then it just goes off on its own and repeats that. Yes. You know, that, that sounds a lot like, uh, I think it's like robotic process automation mm, tools, like right. RPA tools. That's fair. Which is not something that like programmers would use typically. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd make something. But like if you are doing something that uh, maybe is kind of like uh, more like clerical in nature. Mm-hmm. So for example, let's say you are, um, I, I don't know, like, uh, doing like uh, accounting and you're doing like a standard like bookkeeping or something mm-hmm. um, where you're just, I don't know, maybe like categorizing the receipts for a company where um, you're just trying to say like, okay, like uh, this person, they like went out to eat, like uh, we like spent money on servers or whatever. Like uh, that's something that um, is like kind of just like routine um, that I think like a computer could do well. But the problem is, is like, uh, it's somewhat difficult to oftentimes like categorize a receipt to know like exactly what it is. Um, mm-hmm. So like in the past, like um, a lot of re- or like, I mean, I guess like, one of the problems, like, if you look at receipts, right, is like receipts, like a lot of them are often like different formats yeah. They're from like different companies. Sometimes like things are missing. Sometimes uh, it, it's not like all completely itemized mm-hmm. uh, and uh, making sense of that. I, I think, um, this might be really good at. Um, yeah, I actually had a friend who was working on that exact same problem, but this was about uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, definitely pre LLMs, uh, pre uh, when deep learning got really popular. 
And what he was doing is just like sending these pictures to somewhere in India or some other country where it was very cheap for humans to manually annotate the receipts and say how much it was, what the what the item was, and list out all the relevant details. And he couldn't figure out how to get AI to do it. It was it was very challenging, uh, but I do think Gen AI models have gotten a lot better at handling some of the edge cases. So you can have a lot more room uh, for like these long tail of edge cases that can be handled with AI. And I, I think like um, maybe taking a little bit of a step back, apart from automating just single actions, um, I think the goal with like the Rabbit R1's uh, CEO was that eventually once you start collecting enough actions, you'll be able to build a large action model, which has so much data that it can just, you know, have these emergent capabilities and learn how to use any tool on your computer because it's just seen so many examples of using stuff. So that will be really exciting. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I agree. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's kind of funny what it, your friend did. Um, it, it sounds like almost it was the original AI. It's like, <laughs> actually, it's an Indian. <laughs> um, what is that uh, popular example back in the day with uh, this AI chess player but it was just this guy sitting in a box under the chess table oh yeah wasn't that the mechanical turk was that was that what it was i think it was what it was yeah and that's how like uh because amazon has that service i think yeah. like the mechanical turk where there's you know say like hey well, we're gonna pay you like uh a nickel to like label these images or something right. and uh yeah it seems like a very similar there's a chess play automation in 1770 yeah so the o- og ai it's <laughs> It seems like things are just coming out full circle, uh, which is which is pretty cool. So wait, uh, you 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 seem to be a big fan of uh, Claude. Uh, they have tool use. Um, they seem to have a arguably one of the best models out there by itself. Um, although the O one quote unquote model is able to su- surpass Claude on some ben- benchmarks because it's using more agentic behavior, but like a single shot uh, prompt response. I think Claude is pretty good. Um, but we were arguing about this a little while back, and I personally feel like OpenAI still has the best consumer product. They just have so many features that uh, their competitors don't. They have uh, image generation. They have uh, code interpreter. They can uh, generate uh, code and run it. Um, they have the ability now to search the web with search GPT. Um, they have this like notepad thing where you can collaborate on a single document, um, not to mention like the GPT store, which has a bunch of other third party apps that can do really cool things. Um, but Mark, uh, you feel like uh, Claude is still still the best consumer app? So I, I think that if you talk about the entire ecosystem, mm-hmm. I, I think I tend to agree with you that mm-hmm. um, OpenAI has like more just like total number of like raw features mm-hmm. than like claude right i mean mm-hmm. you're right they have the gpt store yeah they generate images um uh it can like analyze you know documents and stuff which which is cool uh they also have like the voice mode uh which is pretty cool mm-hmm. um but but i think that uh you as, even though i agree with you i, I still have been using claude way more mm-hmm. um just because i think that uh, the actual core product, in my opinion, uh, is better. So the core product, I agree with you. I think is the LLM. Yeah, and um, the LLM, uh, I find is just giving me like way better responses. So uh, I, I'm building like some side personal projects um, and doing like a, a lot of programming, and uh, I have been using Claude, and it's giving me way, way, way uh like which is super imprecise but i find that the quality of the responses for programming are significantly better mm-hmm. so uh just today i was uh, using um gemini i was like comparing it to claude and i also was using open ai and i was trying to like do some debugging on like this project that i'm building mm-hmm. and like uh both like open ai and gemini i felt like just could not figure out like the real root cause oh. but claude got it um so um like i i don't know i mean 
like maybe like the stuff I'm doing is like somewhat complex. Mm. Um, but I, I feel like in complex use cases, I, I really prefer Claude. Um, and also, uh, it's true that like OpenAI can do like the web search, but mm. uh, if you use uh, Claude through Kagi, which I use, um, which for those who don't know, Ka- I talk about this a lot, but Kagi is like a paid search engine, like competitor to Google. Um, it can uh, in- add uh, web search to all these LLMs. So you can add like web search to Mistral, Gemini, OpenAI, Llama, and also Claude. Um, so like I've been using Claude with web search for months now mm. and it works fantastic. Um, I've been using it um, to generate code. It works wonderfully. Mm. Um, yeah, I can't necessarily generate images, but like that's fine. I, I don't like use that um, that often. Um, like also you mentioned that like there is no GPT store. Mm-hmm. I mean like fine. Yes. Like Claude Anthropic doesn't have that, mm-hmm. but like, I mean, I think like some GPTs are like kind of cool, mm-hmm. but like I think that like uh, like what a GPT brings is not like that that valuable. I mean, because the thing is, is like the actual barrier to creating like a GPT for the GPT store is like not that high. Uh, it's just like so for those that don't know, like OpenAI has a store where you can go and then have like a like your personal like GPT agent, I guess, where um it you basically will create some sort of like customized like robot that um, you kind of train like an LLM to do like a particular task. So for example, um, maybe like uh, you would basically do some like prompting and then like maybe give like an API to call or something. Um, So I think one of the more popular agents is the, um, what what is it, the Canva or something? I think they have like one of the most popular ones. Canva is really popular. You can make uh, slides with uh, really cool backgrounds, themes, animations, uh, images, text. Uh, Consensus is a really popular one, which we've used a couple of times to do research with uh, scientific articles, which gives you a summary of the pros and cons of the question that you're asking. There's like uh, lots of other ones to uh, make like floor charts, diagrams for specific use cases, verticals, um, therapy, legal, medical. So it is it is pretty big. And I agree that the barrier is really low. So we do get a lot of, you know, the equivalent of uh, the, the fart app on the iPhone or the, the beer app, which does really nothing and is more like a gimmick. But as the store matures, I, I do think uh, we'll see really cool apps. And we have, like, the, some, the few that I mentioned, th- these are pretty useful. Yeah, I, I agree that those, those are pretty useful. Um, and uh, it's, like, very cool. But I feel like, um, in my opinion, like, the most import- important thing is the LLM. Because um, that's kind of, like, the, the brains of everything that's built on top of it. So I think that if uh, Anthropic ever wanted to make a store... Um, I think that they could potentially like far surpass like the open AI one. Cause I, I don't know to, to me, um, like this isn't even like really a knock on open AI, but, uh, I mean, it kind of is like they, they are having a lot of kind of flux in their leadership, hmm. right? Like, um, from the outside looking in, it, it seems like Anthropic is like a much more, uh, kind of like stable company. Hmm. Um, like uh open ai they're losing like top executives left and right it seems like kind of like turning into the sam altman show mm-hmm. um like uh it, which may not be a bad thing it, it could be like i mean sam altman is like uh definitely like he's like a really successful guy and uh he's like made an amazing company um and uh like now he is able to like move quickly um but i think that uh, it's not a good sign, in my opinion, for like a bunch of like the top executives to be uh, leaving and, and creating their own company. And I, I haven't seen that kind of, uh, you know, activity at Anthropic. From the outside looking in, it, it seems like Anthropic is like a, a very stable company that um, is okay to grow like slightly slower. Um, and uh, it seems like they're doing like a lot of like good fundamental research on AI safety and uh, really trying to work on like uh, getting like the AI to do like what you intend. Um, mm. uh, and I, I think that's like a good thing. I'm with you there. Um, I, I do think uh, some of the points that you mentioned uh, on the surface may seem a little concerning, but 
um, you know, they at OpenAI they had like this coup where they tried to oust Sam Altman, and that didn't work out. So it makes sense for the ones who had the failed coup to maybe like leave and move on to different projects. Um, that doesn't say anything about the quality of the product or um, the future of viability uh, or profitability of the company. Um, it's more like an ethical concern, philosophical dispute that they had. And if anything, like you mentioned, it will give more power to Sam Altman and create a more effective company, um, whatever that looks like. Uh, where, where what his vision might be is probably very different from the ones who left. But uh, it it does seem like an authoritarian rule results in a more uh, swift decision-making and um, faster iteration. And, I mean, OpenAI has been championing a lot of uh, really cool fundamental research, too. Uh, not to mention, like, the really cool stuff they have in the pipeline with um, Sora video generation, which is still, it seems like the state of the art. Um, oh, there are a couple competitors uh, coming out. But, again, everyone is trying to chip away at OpenAI with specific features. But I, I, I still can't find any company that has the breadth of features, the distribution, and like the vision that OpenAI has, except for maybe Google. Yes. Um, although I would argue that uh, Anthropic has like some pretty legit distribution as well. Um, mm. So um, AWS, uh, I think they're, you know, like a small up and cover. <laughs> yeah, I think I've heard of them. Yeah, they're, 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 they're you know, okay. Um, but no, a Amazon, yeah. like with AWS, is the number one cloud computing yes. service by a mile. Correct. Uh, it, it's huge. How's you do that? Yeah. And uh, they're uh, they have a service called Bedrock. So Bedrock is something that is used to host LLMs, and Bedrock has Anthropic uh, as like an option, uh, but OpenAI is and. Gemini are famously not options. Mm. So I think that, um, sure, like, I, I agree with you that a lot of, like, startups are making wrappers around OpenAI. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think if you're, like, uh, not, like, some sort of startup that, like, morphed out of a hackathon, you're, like, an actual, like, legit, like, big company. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're a Fortune 500 company, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to, like, want to necessarily use, like, OpenAI uh, for... Uh, your LLM use cases. Yeah. Um, assuming you're not going to host it yourself, you you may consider using something like Bedrock mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of companies that are already using Amazon, uh, something like Bedrock already uh, exists in their ecosystem. Uh, it can be HIPAA compliant. Mm -hmm. um, it, it'll work really well. Uh, just like one more thing that you add and then you'd have kind of control over the LLM. Um, like I, I would see... Uh, a lot more companies wanted to use that as mm -hmm. opposed to OpenAI's model. And also, I think Bedrock allows you to get reserved instances as well. So um, not just like pay per uh, like token, mm -hmm. uh, but you would actually just be able to like kind of like rent like a server that like runs the model and then huh. uh, run on top of that, which I think a lot of companies uh, would like the kind of uh, consistent um, billing as well. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know, like, like, I, I agree with you that, like, OpenAI has, like, a lot of distribution, but I don't think it's a given that, like, a couple of years from now, they're going to continue to still be the top dog. I feel like Anthropic okay. is, um, like, potentially uh, having just as much, like, money and uh, distribution that, like, OpenAI has. And I think that, like, a couple of years from now, like, uh, Anthropic could be seen as, like, the actual top dog. And I would argue that, like, they're kind of sort of, like, becoming that already. Yeah, given how fast things change in this industry, it's really hard to make predictions of uh, what it's going to be like a couple of years from now, let alone like a few months from now. So I'll I'll uh, hold off my uh, vote and uh, wait to see what happens. Um, what, what do we have next? Uh, let's see. A uh, bunch of things that we could be chatting about. Let me check the notes. Oh, yeah. XAI. Um, yeah, so so that's a that's a thing. Uh Sean, what what do you what do you know about that? Um well I I've uh looked at other demos of XAI. It seems like this is one of the few um models that don't have a like a filter on it. Um 
it's you know uh, championed by Elon Musk. So he's a proponent of free speech and uh, no censorship. So I think this is one of the few models that can let you create whatever you want. And it'll say uh, whatever uh, the internet uh, thinks without a filter. And I've heard that he's been ramping up uh, data centers to power this model really, really quickly. Uh, I don't know, some rough numbers like uh, his team was like, oh, this is going to take like six months. He's like, no, you got six weeks. We're going to make it happen. And it, it, it did. He's getting so many NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, I think very few people in the world has the kind of pull that Elon does. I think he just goes to Jensen and asks, okay, I need uh, all the GPUs you got and I'm going to create a lot of buzz. Publicity is going to be worth it for you. Uh, put me in the front of the queue and they seem to be creating a pretty good model with it too. Um, it did have a couple, you know, uh, like late start. Um, they're trying to catch up. Their model isn't nearly as good, um, but it's rapidly improving. And I feel like at this point, you're a big fan of Anthropic, but I think all these models are kind of becoming a commodity. They're all copying from each other, borrowing similar strategies to um, level up their models and bring um, similar features that other companies have. Now it's agentic behavior. So I think eventually it's just going to become a commodity and it's going to be more about what kind of a product and experience you can build out of it. Yes, I, I agree with you. Um, and actually, I, I looked, apparently this article said that it took only 19 days to set up uh, their 100,000 GPU cluster, which is... Uh, wild yeah i was hearing that uh it, they did not use all the standard nb link equipment that uh nvidia offers and they just kind of like uh hacking together their own solution i'm not sure why maybe to have more control maybe to eke out a last bit of performance that they can but they're just using this new ethernet spec to you know lay out their whole networking infrastructure which is oh, it seems like a lot yeah I, I mean that's very cool but um to be fair, I think that there are different types of tasks. Um, so I think that like something like setting up a hundred thousand GPU cluster um, is not one that is like super complicated. Um, like a lot of that is just like logistics. Like you just need to go and like buy like a bunch of GPUs and then like uh, set it up. Like once you know how to set up like two, then like you kind of sort of know how to set up like a hundred thousand. Uh, it, it's it's just like I mean, like, I think I'm, like, maybe, like, making this light. But but I think that, like, um, the thing is, is, like, if you kind of know how to set it up, like, a lot of it is just, like, getting the manpower to do it. It's, like, digging a ditch, right? Like, mm. if you have, like, more people with shovels digging that ditch, you'd be able to build it, dig it faster. But I think that, like, uh, some of the stuff that, like, let's say, like, Anthropic is doing with, um, like, uh, like, fundamental, like, AI research... I think that is not something you'd be like, oh, just do it faster. Because, hmm. like, a lot of that, just like, well, we, we, we don't know how. It's like, uh, what does it mean to do, like, AI alignment faster? Like, it, it's, like, less of, like, a, like a concrete problem. So, uh, I, I don't know. Not not to, like, put down what Elon Musk is doing. or All the hardware engineers are working on this. I don't want to put it down, right? Because it, it's very impressive. It's very impressive. But, like... I, I just I feel like um, it, it's almost like a, a different feat that like we can imagine. But like sometimes like, you know, fiddling with like algorithms, sometimes like you might spend like a month and then change like one line mm. to like optimize something. And sometimes that is actually more impressive than like, oh, we like have a million GPU cluster, which is cool. But like, I don't know, I'm I'm like almost less impressed. Yeah, maybe to paraphrase uh, what I think you were saying is that uh, I think networking is kind of a solved problem. We've been doing it for a long time. People are, have been building data centers for a long time. Uh, there are people out there who know how to do it. Well, uh, I don't, but there are a lot of experts who do this day in and day out. Um, on the other hand, pushing the frontier of generative AI with uh, novel architectures and um new ways of training and surveying and inference and things like that is, is pretty cool. And I think we'll have much bigger returns uh, than trying to uh, optimize, you know, the, the scale of the hardware and the infrastructure um, apart from what, you know, NVIDIA is doing. Uh, yeah. 
Um, so it reminds me kind of like uh, of this one class that I had when I was uh, first learning computer science. This was back in college. And I don't exactly remember uh, what algorithm we were looking at, but um, our, our, my professor was trying to make the point. He's like, hey, look, like uh, algorithms and computers have a lot more power than you think. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, she was like, okay, uh, here's the, this algorithm, right? Now, imagine you had um, like a computer that was 10 times as powerful. Mm. He's like, it would still run terribly um, because it's just like just some, sometimes throwing like computers at the problem is not necessarily like the smart way to do it. Um, he's like, yes, but if you make this like small tweak in the algorithm, look, it runs like a million times faster. Mm. Um, and I, I think that is like oftentimes the case where sometimes like software improvements uh like far surpass any hardware improvements and just because like and also sometimes like the software doesn't even know how to take full advantage of the hardware um like uh sometimes mm -hmm. uh like whenever you make like a change in software like you're there's a lot of things you could do in software that like far surpass like what the hardware could do like even just like sometimes changing the language you write something in like maybe like if you wrote something in python versus like optimized it for the, the cuda architecture mm -hmm. like uh like that optimization for cuda like might be way more effective than like uh just throwing more like hardware at the problem so i feel like hardware like buying more um is sometimes like like a crutch for uh actually doing like the, the hardcore like fundamental like uh, research and like algorithm development that is sometimes needed to like optimize like what you're doing well elon also has a track record of uh poaching and hiring the best and brightest in ai um he got andre karpathy to lead tesla's ai work um so i'm sure he'll collect uh, some of the brightest minds that we have to work on fundamental research in llms too yeah. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I mean, yeah. Elon Musk is an impressive guy. Uh, I, I don't want to put that. I don't want like anybody to, like misconstrue this to say like I think that this is not impressive because one, it's super impressive. Mm -hmm. Two, um, Tesla and Elon Musk have and like uh, XAI and uh, SpaceX have so gotten kind of doing uh, rockets with a chopstick. <laughs> Mirror rank. rank. Uh, there's, there's a lot of impressive stuff going on. Hence. So I, I think that they probably do have a lot of people who are working on like hardcore fundamental research. Um, and they're probably trying to optimize this as much as they can. So uh, if anybody can do it, like I'm not going to bet against Elon Musk. So there's that uh, just making that very abundantly clear. Uh, I think what they're doing is like also very exciting. Yeah. And he's uh, reportedly raising funding again for a $40 billion valuation for XAI. Didn't you say that's how much Anthropic might be worth? Yeah, I, I saw that they were raising money at a, a $40 billion valuation as well, um, which is uh, less than, what is it, OpenAI's value? Is it around 100? 190. 190? Yeah. No, that's, that's about uh, bigger than Intel now, I think. Is Intel at? Um, when does the time to, well, well, I don't know. I, I'd be interested to know what Intel is because uh, Intel has not been doing that great in their stock lately. No, um, but Intel's a hundred billion. Really? Uh, I I feel like I would almost rather own Intel than OpenAI uh, at a hundred billion. I mean, you're you're thinking about uh, the current what like maybe like PE ratio or the value of the underlying assets today. But in terms of uh, a growth stock, I think OpenAI, given that they have the fastest growing product in history um almost a household name at this point for like such a young company i think they're the ones that i'm bet on as opposed to intel which is on their way out well you you might be right but i i guess let, let me defend intel for a minute. <laughs> sure um so yes i i think it's true that intel has fallen uh to the wayside a little bit right like um th there's definitely some issues uh, with the company as a whole um I, I won't deny that but um I, I think that intel um might be like a decent investment for a couple of reasons one uh they're kind of like the only company that i can think of that like really truly like makes and manufactures like all their own like chips uh in the united states um like 
Intel owns like a bunch of fabs. Uh, they um, isn't TSMC opening some fabs in the U.S. too? Yeah, I mean they are. Um, they are like making some stuff in the United States, but like they're headquartered in Taiwan, and like a lot of like their top engineering and mind share is in Taiwan. But like Intel, they're headquartered in Santa Clara in california good uh, geopolitical stability right they have like geopolitical stability yes um they're just actually who knows what the new <laughs> well uh we won't get into that but um you know uh this is the chips act uh and um the the i don't think like the u.s government can let intel fail um i, I think at this mm. point like uh intel is too uh, strategically important mm. for the United States for the uh, for like Intel to go bankrupt. Like, mm. I, I think that what would likely happen is the, the U.S. might just like throw money at Intel and then help them succeed. So, mm. um, I, I think that like yes, Intel has some room to grow, but like, I think like all the components are there of like a company that uh, can succeed. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I guess my my main argument is that like the U.S. won't let them fail. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that like Intel will probably be here. As a counter argument, um, I think we've talked about this a couple of times. We both work at uh, big tech companies, and we see how slow uh, things move at larger companies. Um, and Intel is a big old behemoth, and OpenAI, this young upstart. They are manufacturing and like they, they've designed and they're building its first in-house chip with Broadcom um, as of like last month or so. So I could see OpenAI uh, becoming like the new Apple of this uh, AI age where they're building um, the models and like making the underlying chips that run the models in like, as optimized of a way as possible and have that tight integration and work with TSMC, all these... Uh, design, fabrication, manufacturing companies to have like an end-to-end -end solution. And given how much money some of these hardware manufacturers are making and how hard it is for software companies to find product market fit, to charge people money to use their products on top of that, it seems like uh, OpenAI might take over their uh, chip supply too. Maybe. Uh, I mean, I mean, you could be right uh, with that. Um, but But I think that there is like a fundamental difference between like making an LLM or like making like some software, which I think is uh, not to say it's easy because I think it's hard, but I think like um, building like uh, like a chip fab mm -hmm. to me, it sounds like a really, well, really hard. But they're not building their own chip fab. They're just designing their chips and having TSMC make it. Right. But like Intel has their own fabs. Um, so I think that like it's not better, though. Well, it, it it's not better than TSMC, <laughs> it's not. but like, you know, they're a lot closer to like Intel is significantly closer to beating TSMC as his own game than OpenAI is. Is it? What do you mean? Well, I mean, like, um, th th theoretically, right. I mean, but like, okay. uh, Intel like is already building chips. Like, sure. They're, they're not making, uh, them as good as like TSMC. Um, like they have a, a higher, um, what would it, what's it like that the three nanometer process or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know exactly what like the, the process that, uh, Intel's making, but, um, I think it'd be significantly easier for like Intel to go from like four to two or like four to three mm -hmm. than it would be for open AI to go from not making any chips to like competing with TSMC. I think it's fine to outsource some of these processes to companies that do it better. Um, I don't think there's much value in doing everything yourself if you're not the best uh, in this commoditized space where chips are almost fungible, especially for inference. You can write a few lines to you know, replace the optimizations that you have on the NVIDIA chips and use AMD or Cerebra, Samba Nova. Um, and given that there's so many competitors out there, I don't know how Intel's going to compete with all of them. Um, you might be right. Uh, I mean, I, I think you have a good point. Um, I, I tend to agree. Um, yeah. but 
I still don't think Intel's going to fail just because the U.S. government won't let them fail. But mm-hmm. I, I guess that's like pretty much the only argument I have. And, and also they have uh, a lot of people who know how to like make chips already, um, which is, you know, that's worth something. Honestly, it seems like uh, there's a lot of cross-pollination with these companies. Um, I think OpenAI has been poaching a lot of ex-Google employees who've worked on building and uh, designing the TPUs that Google uses to power their um, AI workflows. So it's like the same people with the same knowledge who all use uh, Broadcom. So Google used uh, Broadcom to design some of their uh, TPUs. Um, and now OpenAI is poaching Google employees and using Broadcom to decide their uh, custom chips. And it's like, it's the same people. Well, <laughs> I guess it's probably a, a good time to be like uh, somebody who really knows how to make custom chips because you can probably just work wherever, anywhere you want and people will probably just throw money at you. I, I think that is one of the most valuable things in this uh, industry right now, the chips. Yes, I, I agree. Um, so if you are somebody who... Uh, is an expert on chips, reach out to us. We'd like, love to talk to you. We would love to, yeah. Yes. We've had a couple other folks from chip companies here. Uh, we've talked to people at Cerebras, at Samba Nova. Um, we need Grok. We need to find somebody at Grok. If you work at Grok, uh, or if you work at Intel, and <laughs> you want to say like how you guys are going to compete, um, or if you work at TSMC, uh, reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. Um, but anyways, we are running out of time, so I think we'll probably end it there, but yes, thank you for listening and, uh, leave us a five star, tell your friends, we're trying to grow this and we'll catch you in the next one.